Hello and welcome back. Do we have enough information to prove beyond doubt that the man we know as Gumnami Baba was none other than Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose? Yes, we do. And I will try within the next few minutes to bring the key points of those evidences to you so that the basic doubt is cleared. In this video, I will not try to cram all the facts about uh, Netaji's return to India and his uh, stay is living in India till 1985. I will just focus on the evidence part, the proof of who Gumnami Baba really was. So let me start with the naysayers, those who deny or those who are skeptical. Their main argument, the first and foremost, which you have got tired of hearing is, how can such a man as Netaji come back to India and not come out in public, stay hidden from public gaze? He was not a person to live like that. So if that is the objection, which is a very justified and logical objection, and uh, even I myself had the same objection in the beginning, then one has to understand that this objection is an opinion. It is not a fact. It is not an evidence which disproves that Netaji and Gumnam Baba were the same person. It is like saying, every day I see the sun rise on the east and set on the west, how can it be anything else? But once you start going through the facts of the case, things should become clear to you. But for that, you will have to make a little bit of effort. What I'm going to present here is only just the surface of it. Then there are people who say that, well, there have been inquiry commissions, official commissions of inquiry, which have uh, rubbished the idea, which have rejected the claim that Netaji and Gumnam Yababa were the same person. But let me correct you there. Justice Mukherjee Commission of Inquiry was the first commission to properly study the Gumnami Baba issue. He did not reject the case. What he said was that there is enough evidence to establish the case. There are credible witness accounts. But there were certain facts which stopped him from reaching the conclusion that they were the same person. What he said was that he could not reach a decision because there was no clinching evidence. We'll talk more about this clinching evidence a little later. After Justice Mukherjee gave his report, which was rejected by the then UPA government, the Allahabad High Court heard this case and passed a judgment in 2013. And there, in that judgment, the Allahabad High Court very clearly said that it was not satisfied with the way Justice Mukherjee had treated the forensic evidence. So what did it do? What did the Allahabad High Court do? The Allahabad High Court ordered another inquiry specifically to establish the identity of the man known as Gumnami Bhava. This order was ignored, rather opposed by the Uttar Pradesh government, both by the Mayawati government and then Akhilesh Yadav government for many years, for almost four years. But then we met Akhilesh Yadav and a commission of inquiry was set up. We were very enthusiastic about it, but then very soon we found out that this was a farce. We could very well figure out what this new inquiry commission was going to write in its report. This one-man commission, led by retired Justice Vishnu Sahai, uh, reached two primary conclusions. First, that this person was not Netaji. And second, it could not say, it did not know who this person was. But whoever it was, whoever he was, whoever Gumnami Baba was, was an outstanding personality. Now, the Uttar Pradesh government did something very funny. By then, Yogi Adityanath had become the chief minister and his government accepted the findings of the report. But in its action taken report, it removed that part, the first part which said that Gumnam Yobha was not Netaji. It accepted the part, it mentioned, quoted only that part which said that the identity of this man could not be established. So in a way, it rejected one of the Sahai Commission's findings that uh, Gumnam Yobha was not Netaji. That was rejected because it was not included in the ATR. It only mentioned that the government accepted the finding of the commission that the man's identity could not be established. Now, why did I call the Sahai Commission a farce? Firstly, it did not call for evidences. It did not call for witnesses. For many, many months, they did not even advertise. So people outside that limited circle of Lucknow and Allahabad and that Ayodhya uh, area 
people did not even know. We were trying our best to reach out to people, but obviously we have our limitations. Justice Sahai did not call for witnesses. Justice Sahai did not call for records. So obviously, without summoning the evidence, how can anybody reach a conclusion? He went through the list of belongings of Gunamiyava, which is known as the inventory. Uh, that inventory took more than one year to be prepared in 1985-86. Just as I have spent all of half a day to go through that entire inventory, all the materials, and he picked up certain letters. And on the basis of that, he passed his, uh, he reached his conclusion. But then there was a bigger problem. The Allahabad High Court had specifically mentioned that it was not happy with the forensic evidence. So it was implied that the new commission of inquiry should have considered fresh uh, forensic evidence. But what did uh, Justice Sahai do? He referred only to the forensic evidence considered by Justice Mukherjee, which was rejected or objected to by the Allahabad High Court. So he went against the Allahabad High Court order in letter and in spirit. So that by itself turns the inquiry into a sham. He did not generate any fresh evidence. He did not generate any fresh information in the forensic uh, part of it. He relied on the previous commission's findings. And that is unacceptable in a commission of inquiry because all commissions of inquiry work de novo means it generates its own information. It does not rely on the conclusions or findings of a previous commission then because because then that is pointless. If you have to accept the previous commission's findings, then why are you doing another inquiry? So now let's come to the positive evidence. Why do we claim? Why do we insist? that it was Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose who came back to India and lived in India, in Uttar Pradesh specifically till 1985. What evidences do we have? What evidences do we present? Now let's look at the material evidence. There are many evidences. So let's pick up the most important ones. First, let's look at the books. Hundreds of books were found in a small room, cramped, packed up, but Hindi, English, uh, Bengali, literature, history, medicine, uh, uh, spiritual, all sorts, which basically pointed out to this man being a very well-read, educated and erudite person. Now, does this prove that he was Netaji? No, it does not. So let's look at another evidence. Household belongings, household stuff. Now, among this household stuff, there were many photographs uh, which belonged to Netaji's family. Netaji's parents, Netaji's uh, brothers and sisters, and uh, Netaji's own photographs. So all these photographs were found in his belongings. Now it can be argued that oh well, well how, how is well how does it prove that the man because he kept Netaji's photos was Netaji himself? That's a fair argument. That does not prove at all. But we also have to ask the question: Why would someone store preserve? those photographs and we have seen from the letters that Bhagavanji used to write he used to ask for specific photographs there used to be clear directions that I want this photograph I want that photograph so there were clear directions going to his followers so why would someone keep somebody else's photographs for all those years that is a question that needs to be answered now as the name goes Gumnami Baba you know what Baba means in the northern part of the country Baba means a mendicant, a roaming sadhu who has no means as such, lives on alms and uh, getting uh, donations and charity and spends his days somehow. Now this person had in his belongings some strange stuff, huge blown up maps of survey of India, of critical strategic points in India. He had huge blown up maps of the road network, the rail network, and all those kind of things uh, in his belongings. Now, what was the Baba doing with all those things? There were gloves, there were binoculars, which were of Second World War vintage and extremely high quality stuff. There were smoking pipes. There were very expensive uh, cigar, uh, cigarette holders, cigar holders. So these are very odd items to be preserved by any so-called Baba. Definitely, it does not go with the description of a Baba. So this person was much beyond that. Does it prove that he was Netaji? No, it does not. But then it also proves that he was not an ordinary Baba. There were hundreds of records 
musical records, long playing records, and uh, classical Rabindra Sangeet, Najul Giti, uh, uh, spiritual songs, all all those things. He he was a he was an avid listener of music. He had a great taste in music. So there were record players, multiple record players. So obviously he was a man with uh, with a great taste in music. Among his belongings was also found a military uniform. Now, all that these things do is to point out to the fact that he was not an ordinary person, definitely not an ordinary run of the mill Baba. But they do help recreate a personality. What do we get? What kind of personality do we get? So here we get a, an extremely educated, erudite, highly intelligent person who reads the classics who reads all kinds of literature, who dabbles in medicine, who is deeply interested and is knowledgeable about global history, particularly the history of the Second World War, military history, Indian history. He is very, very extremely well versed in scriptures, in Indian traditions, in Indian ancient scriptures, the, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the epics, all those. He is extremely well versed. So music, literature, spirituality, medicine, military history, and then the, from the photographs, a very deep interest in Subhash Bose. Okay, so this is the kind of personality that we get from this kind of stuff. Then we come to the most important evidences. Firstly, letters. Tons of letters were found written to him by former revolutionaries of Bengal and other parts of India. People who had known Subhash Bose, people who had worked closely with Subhash Bose for many, many years. And then there are eyewitnesses and written records that these people regularly for decades used to go and meet him at least twice, sometimes even thrice a year. They used to go and spend a few days with him and come back. But the correspondence used to go on. And these were very well-known revolutionaries of Bengal. And the most important part is that all of them, without a single exception, accepted him as Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. So all these revolutionaries, we know from the very beginning how they came to know about Gumnami Baba, how they came to know about Bhagwanji, how they decided how they formed a group and decided that how they should approach him, how they should go and meet him, how they should help him, what they, what all they should do for him. And they continued doing those for uh, nearly three decades, two and a half decades. And they were writing letters, frequent, regular letters about what was happening all around in the world, in India, politics, global national politics global politics very deep discussions were going on in these letters and these people when they used to go and meet him they used to keep diaries they used to take down notes of whatever bhagwanji used to say so we have accessed those notes and those are we have produced them much of them in conundrum most of them actually and they are very high quality analysis of geopolitics of indian politics almost an uncanny, easy knowledge of the deep secrets of the state. And that again points out that this cannot be any ordinary man. A whole range of revolutionaries meeting him, writing to him regularly and accepting him without an eye of doubt that he was none other than Nereji Subhash Chandra Bose. So that is a very big indicator. And this is what uh, Justice Mukherjee found as witness accounts which cannot be challenged, which have to be accepted. He said that there is no reason that their accounts should not be accepted. That was his position after he went through all this. Then what made him take that position of indecisiveness that he could not give an opinion? What was that clinching evidence that was missing? What were the significant facts that stopped him from declaring that Gumnami Baba was Netaji? Well, they were the forensic evidence. And this was the evidence in the form of uh, handwriting analysis and DNA analysis. Now, handwriting analysis. 
Handwriting was analyzed by Justice Mukherjee. He uh, appointed three experts, two official, uh, one in Simla, another in uh, FSL in Kolkata. So they were the ofi official government uh, Sarkari Babus who just looked at uh, the handwritings and somehow just gave uh, the FSL in Kolkata just gave one page report that the handwriting does not match. He did not even have the courtesy of producing a proper scientific report supporting his uh, conclusion as to why has he reached that conclusion how has he reached that conclusion so it was basically a one page notice that i i have seen the examine the handwriting and they don't match the other uh, sarkari report was from simla so which basically produced uh, a table comparing english and bengali handwritings and they said that the they compared the letters and showed that the their opinion was that the handwriting doesn't match now if you see those handwritings and clearly carefully compare them you will find more match than non-match but since they are coming from an expert <coughs> let's take it at face value the other expert appointed by justice mukherjee was uh, just uh, mr bilal mr bilal kapoor now bilal kapoor has, has a reputation of being right at the top and he was at one point of time uh, the chief examiner of the question documents of the government and he uh, became famous with the uh, St. Pritz forgery uh, scandal. Bilal Kapoor, what he did, he actually produced reports, not one report, but reports of his examination, which ran into thousand, more than thousand pages. Now compared to one page report of Kolkata FSL, a three or four page report of Shimla lab and thousand page of report by Bilal Kapoor and he examined the Hindi, Bengali and English letters. Hindi, he, there was not much to be compared so he focused on English and Bengali and he blew up the photographs of each letter formation, analyzed critically and gave his reasoned analysis which ran into scores of pages and he reached the conclusion that the handwriting of Subhash Bose and handwriting of Gumnami Baba were the product of the same person. It was the same person who had written these separate documents. Mere mutabik, to the best of my knowledge and belief, ye opinion jo maine di, ye jo mere se sabit ho saka ke same writer hai, wo bilkul correct hai. That these two writing coincidentally cannot match with each other until they belong to the same person. So I will again say that they belong to one and the same person and this according to me as an expert, this is a very important evidence. But because the two government labs had given the opinion that uh, handwritings don't match, the Justice Mukherjee had to accept that. Then came the DNA part, the DNA analysis. Seven teeth were found in a matchbox when Justice Mukherjee went to Faizabad and went through the belongings of uh, Bhagwanji, which were preserved at the, uh, with the district magistrate, with the collector at that time. And he brought back those uh, teeth and sent them for forensic analysis, for DNA analysis. Blood was collected from Netaji's uh, maternal and paternal side and DNA was extracted from the teeth and they were compared. The analysis was first done by CDFD in Hyderabad. Now CDFD could not extract enough amount of DNA. That's what they said. So their result was inconclusive. So says they sent back the samples. Justice Mukherjee wanted to have a second opinion. So he sent the teeth to Kolkata's uh, CFSL. Now CFSL did a study. They said that they could extract a lot of DNA from those teeth and they compared the uh, blood samples the DNA of Netaji's paternal and, paternal and maternal side and they came to a clear conclusion that the DNA does not match. Now it is basic science which even a class 4 student now understands that if the DNA does not, does not match then two persons cannot be said to be the same. So we were perplexed, we were completely confused that how is it possible that when every other evidence, every, every other fact points towards this man being none other than Netaji, how is the DNA not matching? So then we started digging.
And frankly speaking, we did not know what to do. Now, one of my friends who is a DNA expert, uh, my friend told me that, uh, well, you know what to do? If you really want to find out the credibility of the DNA report of CFSL, ask for something called electrophorogram. Now, by now, most of you know what an electrophorogram is, but I will just briefly explain. An electrophorogram is like the raw data. When DNA is analyzed in a machine, it's not, there is no human intervention. It's put in the machine. The machine goes through the uh, sequence and prints out a chart. And the expert's job is to compare those charts and find out the level of match. So it's a raw data, raw report. So it's basically like an MRI report or a uh, ultrasonography or uh, an ECG uh, chart, which uh, is seen by the expert based on which that expert reaches a conclusion. So that is the report which you can take to another expert for a second opinion. So if you're not happy with the diagnosis of one doctor, you can take these basic reports, the raw data, the fundamental reports and get his opinion. So my friend told me that ask for that electrophorogram. So obviously we asked and uh, asked for a copy of the electrophorogram and as expected, they refused to give a copy. Now it's a global standard, global practice that no DNA uh, analysis, no DNA report is acceptable by anybody, by any agency without an accompanying electrophorogram. And this was the only case where electrophorogram was not there. So without an electrophorogram, the report of CFSL gets automatically rejected. We started asking CFSL from 2017. This is 2023 and they still have not produced the electrophorogram. Repeatedly, they have refused to share the electrophorogram on very flimsy grounds, on very ridiculous grounds. I will not go into that right now. That's not important. But the thing is that without electrophorogram, this result, this analysis by the CFSL is not verifiable and therefore not acceptable. So then we started wondering what is the way ahead? What, what was the way forward? What could we do? Through Right to Information Act, I had uh, acquired all the documents of the Justice Mukherjee Commission by that time. So I had all those reports with me. They had given me authenticated copies. So first we wanted to verify the handwriting analysis, the handwriting examination. So we took samples of Bhagwanji's writings and we took samples of Netaji's writings and sent them to an expert in the US who uses the FBI methodology, who has wide experience and is widely regarded and respected. And we asked him to examine, analyze the handwriting of this uh, handwriting samples from these two different sources, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's handwriting and Bhagwanji's handwriting. We did not give him any background to the case. We did not tell him that this was about Netaji. So for him, it was just like any other case, two samples, two separate samples coming to him for finding out whether they matched or not. Now, he did a very meticulous study, produced a report which ran into 100 pages, more than 100 pages, detailed analysis of each marking, writing pattern, letters, letter formation. And he did a psychological evaluation too. So, and after all this, he found that the writings were by the same person. So, so this is by an expert who is sitting in the US, has no idea what we are talking about. And he gives this report. He does not only give this report telling us that the handwriting has matched. He is ready to come down to an Indian court and defend his finding. First, I want to go across to Kurt Baggett. Kurt Baggett, the handwriting expert joining us from Texas. Kurt, this is Anand here. I hope you can hear us. Uh, and hear me clearly. Thank you. I for can hear you clearly. Yes. Thank you for joining us live. You were sent. You're to, you, you were sent. You were sent two sets of questions, two sets of handwritings, Q1 and Q2. Yes. Did you know that one of them belonged to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose? I did not know anything about the handwriting, and so my opinion is that the same person wrote these two. Uh, questions that you sent me one and two. So that is point one. Point two, the next step, we wanted to re-verify his findings. 
So we took the same set of handwritings to the topmost Indian expert. Kurt Baggett was the American expert who did the analysis and the Indian expert to whom we went was Ashok Kashyap, the topmost handwriting expert in India at that time. Kashyap ji also reached the same conclusion. We have with us in the studio a very, very learned gentleman by the name of Ashok Kashyap. Who is Ashok Kashyap, ladies and gentlemen? Ashok Kashyap is from a family of forensic experts who have been in this business since 1935. Top handwriting expert, expert in examining fingerprints and handwriting. 53 years of experience is what this man has in examining documents. 53 years in experience. Consulted by courts and banks to verify documents. Approached by foreign courts to verify documents. And he's cracked more than 7,000 forgery cases. I've compared the, the suspected writings hmm. with the standard writings hmm. very dispassionately, hmm. very impartially. Hmm. And I have come to the conclusion hmm. that they, they have been written by one and the same person. Although with the passage of time, hmm. there have been certain normal variations. Hmm. But these variations cannot deviate us into, dis into disbelieving hmm. that they could be of different persons. Hmm. We, 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 can't, we, can't, we can't believe like that, hmm. no. So, uh, on, uh, uh, yes, uh, um, uh, on the other hand, hmm. these uh, normal variations uh, augment our, hmm. they augment our understanding of, the, of this case, right. that they are certainly of the same person. Amazing, isn't it? Two different experts, independent experts, sitting in two parts of the world, they reached the same conclusion on the basis of the same set of documents. So there was no more doubt about the handwriting part of it. Now we had to still get clear through the DNA part. So we took the CDFD report. CDFD was the first lab, as I said, which did the DNA analysis. Now, CDFD, as per norms, had submitted the electrophorogram. We took that electrophorogram, we shared that electrophorogram with experts in India, the topmost DNA experts in India and experts around the world. And they found that indeed there was not adequate DNA for comparison, but, but the results, the number of loci that could be compared, where whatever they found showed more of a match than a mismatch. So although the DNA report said that the report is inconclusive, the bulk of the findings, bulk of the data in that CDFD report pointed towards a DNA match. So that is, it can't get more conclusive than that. So we have clear evidence in the form of the revolutionaries, the revolutionary groups who regularly met Bhagavanji for two and a half decades, wrote to him and their letters prove that they accepted him as Netaji. That is proof number one. Proof number two is independent analysis of handwriting. All the three independent experts who had no stake, no interest, no vested interest in this case, clearly said that the handwritings matched. Whereas only it was only the government lab which said the through very shoddy reports that the handwritings did not match. So handwriting matched and DNA here, we proved that there was a forensic fraud. The results actually were very different from what they claimed. So all these three put together leaves no doubt about the identity of the man called Gumna Mivaba Bhagwanji through many other names. And the first pieces of facts, information, which I shared with you about his collection of books, about his interests, about his household stuff, about his collection, all those point towards a very uh, elite, highly evolved personality. So, which matches with Netaji's. So all these put together, all these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle put together leaves us in no doubt that the man whom we came to know as Gumnami Baba was none other than Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose living incognito in India. Now we can answer the question. It is logical now to try to answer that question. If he was Netaji, why did he not come out? 
there are many possibilities and i will talk about that in another episode thank you jai hind